For many years, people in Florida were taught to fear one thing above all else when living near canals and wetlands. The python. Any dark shape under the water was assumed to be that snake. Every disappearance came with the same explanation, and that belief gave people a sense of certainty. At least they thought they knew what they were dealing with. But recently, new pieces of footage have started raising a different question, one that sends a chill down many people's spines. The aftermath being found does not line up with python behavior. It does not match what residents have been warned about for more than a decade. What is troubling is not just the idea that there may be a new predator. It is the possibility that this presence has been there long enough to quietly reshape the ecosystem and waterfront life before anyone gave it proper attention. If you live near a canal, near a lake, or if you believe the threat had already been clearly identified, the question is no longer whether you have seen it. The question is how long you may have been living alongside it without ever knowing. Let us take a closer look. For many years, people in Florida became accustomed to a very specific fear. When something large moved through a canal, when pets vanished, when reports surfaced of a dark shape sliding across the grass at dusk, the answer was almost always the same. Python. The snake became the default explanation for anything unusual happening around Florida's canal systems, wetlands, and suburban edges. It appeared in the news, in control programs, and in the shared memory of the public. People did not feel the need to ask further questions. They believed they understood the predator living among them. That belief offered a sense of control. If you know who the enemy is, you assume the threat has limits. But Florida has long been a unique place when it comes to invasive species. Warm weather, a dense network of waterways, the exotic pet trade, and constant human movement have allowed many species to exist unnoticed for long stretches of time. The state's history of ecological management shows a repeating pattern. Many species are only recognized as serious problems after they have reproduced across multiple generations. By the time the impact reaches everyday life, naming the threat often comes later than people expect. Because of this, the belief that every anomaly could be traced back to one familiar species created a blind spot. When public attention, media coverage, and even reporting systems revolve around a single symbol, signs that do not quite fit are often treated as exceptions instead of pieces of a larger pattern. In recent years, new reports began appearing in a different way. Not as shocking stories or bold headlines, but as small notes buried in local records. Details that did not quite match. Some people said the animal did not hide. It did not flee when noticed. It kept its distance and appeared to watch. In Florida, that is not typical snake behavior. At first, these descriptions were dismissed as mistakes. That is not unusual. In ecology, people tend to see what they have been taught to expect. When one species dominates public awareness, new signs are usually pulled back toward the same explanation. The python had become the template. The problem with templates is that they cause mismatched evidence to be ignored. Repeating incidents remain unconnected. Scattered reports sit quietly in files because no one feels compelled to ask further questions. Meanwhile, the scale of the phenomenon continues to grow. Not in just one canal. Not in just one season. Not told by just one group of people. What matters most is what did not appear in these reports. There were no signs of a new surge in pythons, no matching increase in snake captures, no evidence that a known population was suddenly changing behavior all at once. That was the detail that began to draw the attention of some resource managers. When the same explanation is used again and again, but the surrounding facts no longer fit, the issue is no longer missing information. It is the assumption itself. Florida believed it knew what it was facing, and that belief may have allowed something else to pass through unnoticed. If this animal is not a python, then the next question is not only what it is, but when it first arrived, and more importantly, how many communities it has quietly affected before anyone gave it a name. The earliest clues did not come from clear images. They came from subtle changes that people began noticing in their everyday lives. It was not by chance that the python captured Florida's imagination. For more than a decade, this snake was presented as the clearest symbol of biological invasion. It was easy to recognize, easy to fear, and fit perfectly with how the public understood a threat coming from the outside. That image was repeated long enough to become a reflex. 
When something went wrong in nature, people named the python before asking any further questions. That intense focus brought certain advantages. It helped direct resources, media attention, and policy in a clear direction. But in ecology, shining all the light on one species also means others slowly disappear into the shadows. Once a story already has a familiar villain, observation systems tend to overlook signals that do not fit that script. This blind spot did not exist only among the public. It shaped how reports were written, how data was classified, and which early concerns were treated as priorities. When an unusual event was labeled with a familiar explanation, it was often considered resolved, even when the details did not fully line up. In many cases, mismatched pieces were not challenged. They were simply never connected. Florida is especially suited for this kind of oversight. Thousands of miles of canals stretch across the state. Many communities are built right along the water. Recreation, fishing, and daily life unfold alongside complex natural ecosystems. Not every change is obvious. A new species can exist at the edge of human awareness for many years before crossing the threshold that demands attention. In that setting, the python became a safe explanation. It was dangerous enough to justify unease, and familiar enough that it did not force people to ask harder questions. When a pet disappeared, when bird numbers declined, when a canal suddenly felt quieter, the python answer closed the conversation quickly. But the blind spot did more than hide a single species. It obscured the scale of the problem. Florida has not been facing one invasion, but several overlapping invasions, each affecting the ecosystem in different ways. Some target small mammals, some go after eggs and young. Others alter the behavior of native species at levels that are difficult to observe with the naked eye. When everything is reduced to one cause, those differences are flattened. That leads to inaccurate risk assessment and slower responses than necessary. In ecological management, time is never neutral. A species may go unnoticed in its early years, but by the time the signs become clear, the surrounding ecosystem has already changed. One detail began to concern some resource managers. While Python control programs did not show matching spikes in areas where unusual events were occurring, the changes continued. That suggested the story was missing a key piece. Not because data was lacking, but because the data was being read through a lens that had become too familiar. The Python was once Florida's loudest warning about biological invasion. But when a warning becomes too familiar, it can unintentionally drown out other warnings forming nearby. In that space, another threat may have quietly adapted, learned how to persist, and expanded its influence before being properly identified. The earliest changes did not arrive as clear discoveries. They did not come from direct encounters, nor from shocking images. In ecology, that is not unusual. Many of the most dangerous invasions reveal themselves not through presence, but through consequences that quietly accumulate over time. In some areas, resource managers began noticing gaps that were hard to explain. Not a sudden collapse of entire animal populations, but scattered losses that kept repeating. A canal that once showed stable biological activity grew quieter during familiar periods. On their own, these changes were not alarming. But when they appeared in multiple locations under similar conditions, they formed a pattern that became difficult to ignore. Some cases drew attention because of how they unfolded. The traces left behind did not fully match what people expected from python activity. Pythons kill in a fairly consistent way. They ambush, constrict, and cause death through sustained pressure. That leaves very specific signs. In many records, those familiar signs were incomplete. Instead, there were irregular injuries and indications that the events happened more quickly. At first, these differences were explained in the safest way possible. Perhaps multiple species were involved. Perhaps environmental factors distorted the evidence. These explanations avoided confronting a larger question. They were not entirely wrong, but they shared one limitation they pulled new information back into an old framework instead of acknowledging that the framework itself might no longer explain what was happening. As reports accumulated over time, the focus shifted away from individual incidents toward their repetition. Similar changes appeared in areas that did not record corresponding increases in Python numbers. This did not deny the Python's role in the ecosystem, but it weakened the assumption that the Python was the only explanation. In field research, when one variable no longer accounts for the results, the next logical question is whether another variable is operating alongside it. Another clue involved speed. 
Some impacts seem to emerge faster than what is typically observed when a new predator gradually increases in number. Usually, ecosystems require several seasons to show clear responses to a new invasive species. Here, some changes occurred before there was enough data to suggest that python populations had reached a new density threshold. That pointed to an agent that may have adapted very efficiently from the beginning. At the same time, the way residents described the problem quietly shifted. Instead of talking about what they saw, they spoke more about what they no longer saw. Less movement along the canals. Fewer familiar signs during hours that had once been predictable. For communities that have lived near the water for generations, these were not small details. They were signals that something fundamental in the ecosystem was drifting out of balance. At this stage, the issue was no longer about immediately identifying a specific species. The issue was recognizing that an impact was underway that had not been fully described. When original assumptions no longer explain what is being recorded, continuing to rely on them becomes a risk. Not only a scientific risk, but a risk to the communities living with these changes every day. When field observations stop matching familiar assumptions, the next response is usually not certainty, but a careful review of the data. In ecological management, this is the moment when instinct gives way to what can be measured, compared, and verified. Not to force an immediate answer, but to eliminate explanations that are no longer convincing. The first step is comparison across locations. If pythons were the primary cause, their impact would generally increase alongside recorded population density. But when unusual events continue to appear in places without a corresponding rise, the cause and effect relationship becomes less clear. This does not deny the role of pythons, but it raises a practical question. Is something else acting at the same time? The next step is comparison over time. In many ecosystems, the influence of a new predator follows a familiar curve. Early effects are slow, then accelerate once the population reaches a certain size. Yet some of the changes being recorded appeared earlier than that expected pattern. When timelines do not align with the model, the original assumption has to be reconsidered. At this stage, researchers begin widening the scope of their questions. It is no longer just about which species is present, but what kind of behavior could create these effects. In ecology, behavior can matter just as much as numbers. A species can have an outsized impact if it targets sensitive links such as eggs or juveniles, even when its overall population remains limited. Analysis also shifts to the system level. Florida's canal network connects many different habitats, from residential areas to lightly disturbed natural zones. A factor that can move easily through this system can create ripple effects that are difficult to recognize when each location is viewed on its own. When data is layered onto maps, gaps begin to appear in places once considered stable. At the same time comes a review of exclusion hypotheses. If there is no sudden surge in a known species, and if environmental factors like weather or water quality fail to explain the changes, what remains is not speculation, but an admission that the current picture is incomplete. In field research, admitting that something is not yet understood is often a more meaningful step than defending an outdated explanation. Here, the data does not offer a clear conclusion, but it does something equally important. It reveals the limits of the current approach. When figures, maps, and timelines no longer support the original assumption, continuing to rely on it becomes a risk. Not because it is certainly wrong, but because it may be obscuring other factors that deserve attention. And it is at this intersection, between what the data can explain and what it cannot, that the story begins to shift. Not toward a new claim, but toward a gap that needs to be filled. A gap that, if left unexamined, can continue to grow unnoticed until the consequences become too obvious to ignore. For communities living along the canals, the first impacts were not measured in statistics. They were felt as daily routines began to change. Some residents say they no longer let pets near the water the way they once did. Canal paths that used to host evening walks feel quieter. Not because of one specific incident, but because the environment no longer feels as predictable as it once was. These changes are especially noticeable in neighborhoods built closely around water. In Florida, many communities are designed around canals, boat docks, and open spaces next to nature. When ecological balance is disrupted, the boundary between nature and daily life becomes more fragile. People do not need to see a clear threat to feel instability. Adjusting just a few familiar habits is enough to create lingering concern. 
In some places, that concern turns into practical questions. Are current control systems keeping up with what is happening? Do decisions made at the management level reflect what local communities are feeling day to day? These questions are rarely asked in confrontational ways. They surface in short conversations, during community meetings, and through personal choices that seem small on their own. Economic effects also begin to surface, though quietly. As the sense of safety declines, the way people use waterfront spaces changes. Recreational activity becomes more limited. Some residents rethink long-term plans in areas once considered stable. These shifts do not cause immediate crisis, but they accumulate over time, much like the ecological changes that came before them. At the center of all this is a shared feeling. People are not sure what they are living alongside, and they are not confident that current measures are addressing the right issue. When a threat is not clearly named, it exists not only in the environment, but in the collective mindset. At that point, the question is no longer just what is happening, but when these changes might stop, and whether they are moving in a direction that no one truly controls. Florida has been here before. A species appears. It is dismissed at first. Then it is named. And eventually it becomes a problem people believe should have been recognized sooner. That cycle is so familiar it has almost become part of Florida's modern story. But familiarity carries risk. It convinces people they have learned the lesson, even when the conditions that created the problem remain unchanged. What makes this situation different is not only the nature of the threat, but how it is being identified. Not through a single defining moment, not through a number that shocks the public, but through the growing sense that old explanations are no longer sufficient. When assumptions that once reassured people begin to lose credibility, the space they leave behind is not easily filled. In ecological management, asking the right question can be as important as finding the answer. The question is not only which species is present, but which systems allowed it to exist long enough to become part of the landscape. Those factors rarely come down to one decision. They emerge at the intersection of trade, consumer habits, urban planning, and how people interact with nature over time. Florida continues to invest resources in controlling threats that have already been named. But control is always a response, not a starting point. When measures are built on assumptions that are no longer complete, their effectiveness becomes difficult to judge, especially for communities adjusting daily to changes around them. At the level of everyday life, the question is no longer academic. People living along the canals are not asking which species is more dangerous. They are asking whether their surroundings are still safe to use as before, whether the changes they feel are temporary or becoming a new normal, and whether anyone is truly seeing the full picture before today's small adjustments turn into long-term limits for the next generation. Florida once believed it was dealing with a threat that was already understood. But when data, observation, and community experience no longer align with that belief, what remains is not panic. It is an unanswered question. A question about how threats form, go unnoticed, and eventually become accepted. And most importantly, a question about whether this cycle will ever stop, or whether it will repeat again under another name before anyone is prepared to recognize it. Thanks a lot for sticking with us till the very end. If you found this video useful, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you won't miss any of our daily uploads. And now, go ahead and explore some of our top recommended videos popping up on your screen. Goodbye, and see you in the next one.